Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining my presentation on this weird beetles parasitic on bees. This will be the outline of my presentation. First, I'm going to give you a brief introduction on this study. We're going to talk a little bit about the family uh, of the beetles and the questions that I wanted to address in this study. Towards the end, I will give you uh, some, I will show you some photos and a cool video, and we'll talk about uh, the potential for this study, and hopefully there will be time for questions. So I conducted this study at the Brockby lab, uh, working with Dr. Miriam's research on her long-term bee monitoring. So as part of her uh, bee monitoring study, the bees were pan trapped on a bi-weekly basis, primarily at the Glenridge Quarry naturalization site, but also other areas in Niagara. So as the bee taxonomist in the lab, I started noticing uh, some insect-like creatures that were um, attached to the wings of some of the bees, but not others. So particularly on halictid bees. So it turned out that these creatures were actually the first insert larvae of uh, also called triangulins of beetles in the family Ripiforidae. So just some cool facts about the family. The Ripiforidae is a small group, but has a fascinating biology. They, like all the species, are parasitic on juvenile insects. Some species will specialize on the immatures of cockroaches. Some um, others will specialize on the larvae of wasps. And most importantly to us, um, all the species in the genus Ripiforus will specialize on bees. So um, some species, um, just in the case of Ripiforus, they exhibit phoretic behavior and hypermetamorphosis, which is just a type of complete metamorphosis, but it's unique in the sense that um, the very first instar larvae is very active, um, usually the one who shows the phoretic behavior and just looks completely different from other subsequent insters, uh, which pretty much look like um, couch potatoes. So um, because of this complex biology and the fact that the adult stage only lasts for one or two days, it's, um, it's a group that is very difficult to study and poorly collected. So of course I wanted to know what uh, type of triangulins I had, what the species was. So it was possible to identify the triangulin to genus using morphology. However, there are no identifications guides for the species based on the triangulins. So I sent some samples for DNA barcoding and uh, hooray, turned out that it was Ripiforus fasciatus um, and it's a species known from DNA barcodes from the area in southern Ontario. So for my second question on the biology of Ripiforus fasciatus, I did two things. I revised the lit review, and I did some lit review, and I also did some field trips. So from the lit review, I learned that not much is known from Ripiforus fasciatus. There is a complete study on the natural history of Ripiforus Smithy on Diadacia consociata, which is an Amphorinia and Apidae, um, but these species are restricted to the west coast of North America, so it's a different scenario of what we had here, but, um, but all species in the genus Ripiforus are presumed to have this, this natural history of Ripiforus Smithy. So um, for Ripiforus fasciatus, there's nothing really uh, complete. Everything is fragmented and scattered. So this is a picture of uh, the Glenridge Quarry naturalization site where we found the, uh, where we trapped the bees on which we found triangulins on. And um, here I went and, uh, and collect some eggs, like triangulins and one female adult this past uh, summer. So with that information, I was able to construct this life cycle for Ripiforus fasciatus on halictid bees. 
and I found the adult, let me see the pointer, found the adult in August. I also found the eggs right at the same time in buds of, uh, sorry, Solidego canadiensis uh, flowers. And so the triangulins will hatch from the eggs and will just start crawling around the flower waiting for a bee to visit. Once this happens, it will crawl onto the bees, it will get around on the bee um, and eventually will make it back to the bee's nest where it will stay attached to the bee for the whole um, overwintering period. In the spring, once the bee starts making the pollen mass, then the triangling will come off the, um, the bee and sit on the pollen mass and wait until the bee egg hatches. Once this happens, it will go into the bee larvae and wait until the bee larvae is fully developed. Then it will come out, um, not as a triangulant anymore, but as a second Easter lar larvae and will start devouring the poor uh, bee larvae. These are the couch potatoes here who eventually will become pupae and, um, and the cycle will repeat again. This is just an example of how things can go so bad if you keep your enemies too close. Um, so for my third questions on the bee host for Ripiforus fasciatus, this is my, uh, this is a table of my results for the observation on triangulins on halictid bees. We found triangulins on all of these 15 species, which are new records for Ripiforus fasciatus, and uh, except for Halictus confusus. So we found infestation rates ranging from 2% to 100%. However, if we remove Lasioglossum foxy, which we only had one individual that we examined, um, we get a more, more accurate interpretation from uh, infestation rates ranging from 2 to 16%, which is, which is more accurate to say. Um, now let's look at the species where we didn't find any triangulins, um, except for Agapostum on virescence, I am afraid to say that we didn't have enough um, sample, like it was not a, a large sample data to, to, to begin with, because these are very rare species that we just rarely collect them, right? But we can do some analysis with this uh, Agapostum on virescence. Mm -hmm. In fact, for um, some of the species, Anagochlora pura and some of the Elasioglossums dialectus here, there are some records that they are host species for Ripiforus, other species of Ripiforus. So um, we just with this study, we cannot say that they are not. So more samples are needed. So there seems to be an association of these beetles with social host, or at least by vaulting host. And why is that? Well, this can be explained by the fact that social female bees are more abundant at the time that the beetle adult is around compared to uh, solitary species, for example. So here on the left, we have um, the phenology for Agapostum on virescence, our solitary species. And we see here that when the adults are around and the triangulins are on the flowers, uh, there are not very many females of the bees around that they can carry the triangulins back to the nest. However, in the case of an social species, this is for Lasioglossum admirandum, and it's just a typical phenology for any social species. And we can see here that when the adult is around and the triangulins are on the flowers, and there's still a lot of females that will carry the uh, triangulin back to the nest, and we will find it at this time of the year on, on pan trapped bees. So this is just to show you a cool uh, pictures that I took this summer. This, you can see the eggs here, very cozy in the flowers of Solidego canadensis. Here are more mature eggs, almost ready to hatch into triangulins. 
Now this is just a close picture, close up picture of what you will see of uh, the Ripiphorus on the wing. This is a microscopic uh, preparation. You can see here their mandibles from which you, they attach on the wings and they are very difficult to, to when you prop them with pain, they're just, they're so attached, they're very difficult to detach from the wing and you can't really see it very clearly, but there is some sort of a suction cup here that uh, you'll see in the video next that they, they use as a, like I would say a seven foot or something like that, um, just like to pivot around and move around. It's very useful for them. They also have pads here called pulvillis, which they um, use for attaching to the body of the bees. These are the females, not very attractive, unfortunately. I think that the male is more promising. Uh, you will see a picture of it um, at the end of the presentation. However, I did not collect it. Um, and this is uh, just a short video that I wanted to show you. Well, it's a long recording, but I won't be showing you all of it. And these are the crawling triangulings. This is where I opened one of the buds and suddenly all started cra crawling around and just uh, looked like in random orientations. So I uh, will move this forward just for you to see the reaction of one of the triangulins where when I um, put a bee close to it, you will see coming from here and trying to grab onto the bee. There you are, it's like trying to reach. It missed it, but it was just to see how the triangulins react. And I want to go through all of it. So just for the summary, this, as you can imagine, is just a pilot project. I promise you I won't be doing my PhD on, on this um, beetles because I'm more interested in systematic of bees but but it's a it's a project that has a lot of potential there's a, all kinds of directions for it um i have highlighted here some of the things that have come up during um during this study so i would like to thank people in the Brogby lab who have assisted me and also bear with me with my obsession with these beetles and also the Packard lab for uh, helping me with this uh, DNA uh, barcoding samples. Thank you so much. I hope there's still some time for questions. Great. Thank you, Nora. That, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, so we have a few questions here. Um, we have time for them. Um, so we'll just start with uh, Susan Chan asked, um, if our fasciitis devours the larva, uh, how do they get out of the soil where the bees nest and when do they emerge? Um, so they would be, they will be emerging around August, where is where the adult was found. Um, and sorry, what was the other question? The question, um, if the uh, so adult... Uh, if they devour the larva, how do they get out of the soil where the bees nest? Um, they crawl out. Yeah. Okay. They crawl out from the, on the ground. Yes. So uh, similar, uh, Nicholas Dorian asked, does our fasciitis wait in the brood cell for the larva to fully develop? Or does it burrow into the early instar uh, bee larva? What I know from, no, what I know from uh, Ripiforus smithy is that they will pupate and then they will make themselves, once they're adult, they will make themselves, for themselves out from of the ground. So no more association with, with the bee anymore once they're adult. Um. And then this is about the abundance. So uh, King Lu James Hung asked, how many flowers do you have to check to find eggs and triangle? <laughs> well, well, that, yeah, that's a good question. Where I knew where, I knew where we found um, triangling. So, um, you know, 
but so I didn't have to to look a lot. Uh, it only took me like maybe two or three days of collecting and dissecting. But um, but if you do it just in a random place where you don't know if the triangle is around, then it will be much more difficult. You know what I mean? So so it was it was very useful to know that uh, the triangles were present around the area, and I just I just had to collect. Um, around that area to uh, be able to find the adult and the triangulants and the eggs and all that.